much, Alithia. And um, yeah, and welcome um, everyone. And thanks for having me. Um, Mickey and I both wanted to go second and, um, and I've ended up going first, <laughs> but that's fine. <laughs> Um, and I think one of the themes that really draws us all together that Alithia mentioned is this both longing and need in the world to start moving past these dominant power over systems to more power with systems. And I'd like to start just by unpacking a few principles from my dear um, friend and colleague and teacher, uh, Peter Koenig, this perspective of source that you've heard uh, mentioned. So the first thing to say here is this isn't actually fundamentally about leadership, um, nor is it about organizations. Those are certainly very related concepts, but really this is about creativity. So it's the creative process of how we bring new things into the world or bring change into the world to the systems um, that affect our lives. And it's also not really a theory. It sometimes gets called a theory. And I guess in some ways you could you could call it that. But, you know, if it were a scientific theory, it would be a lousy one because there's no falsifiable hypothesis. Any counterexample you could find could be explained quite neatly within the principles. So the best way to think about what I'm unpacking here for you is that it's a lens, it's a way of seeing, um, a way of sense making um, with a view to being more creative, to being able to make the things happen that the world really needs today and that your, your soul is calling you um, to work on. And Peter developed this through observation. So it wasn't, it's, it wasn't sort of a framework that he decided would be good. Um, that he's proposed to the world, but rather he's looked at what seems to be going on when things are either in a state of creative flow or when they're getting stuck, and then extrapolated the principles from there. Um, and really, if we follow these principles, it helps us to be more creative. And I've seen this many times in the 10 years I've been working with these principles. And so where this starts is this idea that, that all of us can be what Peter would call a source. And that means being a creative being in the world. So someone who can be a channel or even an embodiment of perhaps something even from the spiritual realm, depending on your, on your belief system, um, that, you can, that you can make something happen, that you can see an idea from the conceptual world to reality, to manifest it in the world. And that's the point where all of us are peers and equal because we're all capable of being, of being sources. And as we do that, we can either um, start something new. So maybe some of you here have started a project, an initiative, something you might call a nonprofit or a company, whatever it might be. But you could say that underneath that, that company or that nonprofit, there's a creative process. There's something that you're trying to, to bring into the world. And when we either start something or join something that someone else has started, we can notice that there is an order, like an order of, of invitations. Um, and so if we take this call, for example, you know, I really acknowledge that Alithia is the source of this. She was the one that said, we're having an interesting conversation about source and collective leadership. We should have an online, online dialogue with Tom and, and Mickey. And I accepted the invitation. Mickey accepted the invitation. And now here we are and something has happened in the in the world. But there's this this order. So even though on the one hand, you know, we're equals, you know, Alithia doesn't see Mickey or I or Lena as fundamentally any less than she does. At least I certainly hope she doesn't. I'm sure she doesn't. Um, yet there is an order. And I'm really happy to acknowledge that and to hold that as sacred as well, to, to, to honor the fact that she opened up this space that we've that we've stepped into. Over 100 of us have stepped into, in fact. And the same is true for any creative initiative that you can think of. When we look closely at it, what Peter discovered is you can find exactly one individual in this unique role that he called the role of source that has a special connection to the unfolding creative process, sensing where the edge of it is, what's in and what's out, what the next step for the initiative as a whole is. And it's not something we can decide. So we can't just have a vote to decide who's going to be the source. It's a naturally emergent role. And what we also find is that the personality, the character or the soul of the, of the source is also kind of made manifest in the, in the culture, in the, the creative field that they establish when they take the initiative to start something new. 
And this is true also from everything we've seen so far. And I really welcome any, any counter examples that we, can, that we can explore further because this is a working set of principles. It's open to change when better evidence comes along. But even in the most participatory, supposedly decentralized initiatives you can find, we still find this one individual um, in, this, in this unique um, role. And actually, many of us who come to start working with these, these source principles do so when we see things breaking down and not realizing their potential in these very collective, um, often decentralized spaces. Sometimes this happens, a classic one is after a founder ostensibly leaves, often with a story that I've left, it doesn't really matter anymore that I was the founder, I've now left this to everyone. And then slowly over time, we see it unravel, descend either into power struggles or endless dilution of the vision and other, um, and other symptoms. Um, and it's almost like, the, the role of source affects a creative process, almost like a force like gravity. Um, and so the choice is really to whether we acknowledge it and just say there seems to be something that's acting on what's unfolding here um, and work with it consciously. And as we do that, we can actually be more creative and see more come to life that the world needs or get confused and surprised when we fall over because gravity has, has exerted its force um, anyway. And then, and then finally, when it comes to, to leadership, I already mentioned that the source is something slightly different from leadership. And often the person in the role of source in an initiative holds actually quite a vulnerable role, very different from um, these sort of hero visionaries or, or big sort of famous entrepreneurs that we see, although often some of those are sources. But actually, they're holding something that's quite vulnerable because this creative process is really coming from their soul and they need others to lead, perhaps everyone to show to show leadership within their invitation such that the thing can come to life. And what I think we've seen, I think everyone on this call will probably agree, we've seen far too much top down styles of leadership, the dehumanizing, the power over, the bureaucratic um, I'm, I'm guessing I don't need to preach this to anybody who's joined a call um, like this. But what I do sometimes see is we then overcompensate that we have this idea that hierarchy and top down is all bad. Decentralized bottom up is all good. We must move everything to totally participatory. And actually, you know, what, what I've um, what I believe right now is that it's a it's a real human superpower that we can innovate all kinds of ways of leading and, and organizing and collaborating to make things happen together. Some of you who might have read, I just dug this off my bookshelf earlier, um, Graeber and Wengro's book, The Dawn, um, Dawn of Everything, you know, where they talk about how um, going back to pre-modern times, you know, humans have organized in both top-down, bottom-up ways, and ultimately what's needed, I would say, um, in order to realize a vision is leadership that's appropriate to the context and what needs to get done rather than it being ideological that it must be one way or it must be another way and actually personally i believe that more participatory more bottom up is generally the way is generally what we need much much more of but i still think there is also a place for top down sometimes to to cut through things so anyway, there's loads more I could say, but I want to pause there and hand over to, to Mickey, um, and then we'll see what kind of dialogue unfolds from there. So over to you. Thank you. I want to pause for a second just to allow me and you and everyone else to just take in all that's been said, not to like jump into a new thread. So just a few seconds of silence. Mm. Thank you. I want to start uh, with a vulnerable expression right away, because it is part of my style of leadership and what I want to see much more of in the world, which is that I'm actually quite nervous being here. And the reason I'm quite nervous being here is because as far as I can believe, and I don't know this, but as best my understanding is, most of the people who are on this call operate in one form or another within the system as it is, trying to push it, pull it, shape it, change it, but fundamentally within it. 
And I am operating as much out of the system as I know to, knowing full well that it is a total illusion to imagine that I actually can. So that, that tension of wanting to be there and knowing that is illusion. And anytime I am in a context where there are certain premises that I'm not even going to get into, but one that particularly gets me is the thought that business can be a force for good. There's something about that that really, really, really gets me. And then I instantly feel lonely and like in deep despair. And I lose, I lose my own strength. And because I didn't know if that would happen or not, I put out a call to people in my network, in my close network, to come and catch me if they see that I lose coherence or look wobbly in one form or another, and then to actually step in. I told them very clearly they are welcome to interrupt me, not anyone else. So even if they think that I'm affected by what somebody else is doing, I don't want them to interrupt anyone else because no one else has an agreement with them. I'm the only one who does. And so they are here. I'm not going to introduce them. They're uh, quite a number of several of them. Initially, it looked like there wasn't going to be anyone. And now I, I lost count. There may be five or six of them. And it is an amazing thing to have so much love and so much orientation to supporting my leadership as exists in my field. It's really exceptional. I don't know that many people, if any, who have that specific personal thing. Now you would think, how is this related to the topic that we came here? It has everything to do with developing an entirely different paradigm and I'm not saying that Tom isn't talking about a different paradigm. I'm not in any way responding to Tom right now. This is going to come later. We're going to engage with each other and see what happens. Right now, I'm just saying where I'm coming from. And within that paradigm, a primary question related to how we function together is what I call the capacity lens. And the capacity lens is super simple and super radical. And people can sometimes lose either the simplicity or the radicality and not get it. So I will try to explain it very briefly. The capacity lens is a rigorous practice that says, I will honor my own capacity limits and we can connect that all the way to honoring planetary limits. The, the deep groove of overstretching, overriding ourselves, whether we are in a leadership position or not, is completely directly related to our lack of concern for planetary limits. There is a direct link. Any time we are overriding ourselves, we are contributing to planetary extractive practices. So it's honoring my own capacity limits, which includes the willingness to leave a void, to not do something if it's out of capacity. And simultaneously, a deep rigorous commitment to trusting what other people are saying about their capacity limits instead of what we usually do, which is when somebody says, I don't have capacity, we interpret it as they don't have willingness or they don't have commitment and we judge them. Functioning within capacity is an extraordinary practice that gives us accurate picture of what is it that we actually can do together and what we cannot. And there's, I talked so far about individual capacity and then there's collective capacity which isn't even exactly the sum total of what all our individual capacities are, because it is also the relationship between our different capacities, the level of trust that we have, the practices that we have for collective uh, processes. And in addition, something that I call non-redundant capacities. 
I think this is what intersects to some degree with the source concept, or I want to leave that till later. Whenever someone has non-redundant capacities, they cannot be replaced. And that may be capacity for vision. It may be capacity for convening and bringing people together. I think, Alicia, that that relates to the thing that in the end you're not bringing into today, which I forgot the name of it. The, the just full circle them. leadership model. Yes. Yeah. Um, and when we get into notions of equality that mean that everybody has to do the same thing, we are losing the non-redundant capacity that exists wherever it exists. So that, that's, the, that's the lens from which I look at leadership. Period, new sentence um, that doesn't directly connect, which is um, even though I was talking about the source of the word in Hebrew, my actual understanding of leadership is not about giving direction. My understanding of leadership is an orientation to caring for the whole and a willingness to care for the whole in interdependent relationships with others, whatever that means, which is a lifelong to discover. What does it mean to be in interdependent relationships with others while caring for the whole and doing it even when others don't? So when other it's a it's a deep practice and intense practice. And that is how I orient to leadership. In terms of that question of collective leadership, all this was as I understand collective, distributed, decentralized, all these words kind of like overlap in some ways, as I understand it, is finding together the best way to attend to all the needs that we're trying to care for, leaning on existing capacity rather than aspirational capacity, which isn't there, while aiming to minimize unwanted impacts. That is my sense of the puzzle. And that puzzle becomes really difficult when all of us, every single one of us, is socialized into patriarchal conditioning, which has absolutely nothing to do with sex or gender or anything like that. It has everything to do with being an assault on biology and an assault on life and a framework rooted in scarcity, separation and powerlessness. And whether we are in a position of leadership or not, these things are either in us in the system and agreements that we implicitly have or in others. So I can orient towards participatory processes. If others are not empowered, they won't. They will defer to me, they will rebel, they will criticize me, they will leave and do their own thing. And I don't have the capacity ever to shift that in others only to work with it most optimally. So given the time that we are in the world is a very difficult practice which I'm trying 24 seven and would be very happy to apply the successes and deep successes and deep failures from the experiment called nonviolent global liberation to whatever questions arise first with Tom and then with others. I'm really hoping that we will branch beyond just you and I, and we'll actually engage with other people. All right. I think I'm done. Good. Thank you. Also, let's just keep a moment for a breath and take it all in. As um, we have been talking, yeah, from individuals and collectives up to, let's say, the big challenges of our time and then offered as well an understanding of the source concept and then as well an understanding of, of leadership and the capacity lenses. So thank you so much for offering us this context. I would now leave it to you to see how you want to engage in the nuances, what is it that you want to discuss 
And then I'll come back once maybe I see, okay, you know, we have discussed for a while and maybe it's time to bring in some questions that Lena has been already sorting. And I have, in case we have time as well, a couple of challenges uh, for both of you to see how can we solve some challenges from the collective leadership perspective. So I'll... And all this in 45 minutes or are we willing to extend? Uh, yeah, no, all of this sadly in, in about 45 minutes. Let's see how far we get. And if not, we can also do a second time, maybe. Let's see. Yeah, over to both of you. Tom, where would you like to take it? Oh, there's so much, there's so much there, isn't there? I mean, certainly that um that common ground about the extractive system that we're all that we're all part of even when we're trying to step outside into into a new different um kind of paradigm um i'm, I'm really interested i mean part of me wanted to dig into your um your question about about business and whether business can be a force for good because when i think about business it's it's so broad like for me that could include exxon mobil <laughs> sort of a one end of a spectrum to to a company like like greater than which is which is a business and you know couldn't be more different to i don't know a psychotherapist self-employed who has clients who pay for their work like all of those are businesses and to me they're um there are greater differences between at least those three those three things and there probably are between any of those things and some other initiatives that we wouldn't even call businesses at all um, mm -hmm. so I'm curious like about sort of where you you draw the lines I know that that might be provocative for a lot of people to say business can't be a force for good and if if so you know is, is it inherently bad or, or evil or, or something like that but what is it that you, you mm -hmm. see I'm, ha I'm happy to say it. I, I, I want to say that words like bad and evil are not part of my worldview at all so I, I don't I don't think in such terms. I would say, uh, I take it all the way back to, um, as I understand life, um, life in some kind of like deep abstract way cares for everything that lives through an endless flow of energy and resources. And humans lost trust in that. And the losing trust in that means wanting to take more than we actually need out of fear that there won't be more later. That to me is the seed of the transformation in human evolution that I call patriarchy for reasons that are well beyond what we can talk about today. So you can call it domination systems, enforceable domination, whatever you want to call it. There are reasons I call it patriarchy, but it's not so important for the moment. So how does that work? When you accumulate, you remove things from circulation. When you remove certain things from circulation, there is less for others. The ancient wisdom of many indigenous cultures, I don't, I'm not an indigenous culture expert, but the, I know that the ancient wisdom is that when everyone takes only what they need, not more and not less, there's always going to be enough. And so if we exit that and accumulate, we Instead of flow, we create the twin phenomena of artificial surplus and manufactured scarcity. This is my concern about business, that it is inherently an accumulating endeavor. Mm. And maybe I would be very easy to say there is a big continuum of how much accumulation there is and how much the drive to accumulate influences choices, all the way from a mom and pop grocery store, where it's basically that's within the system as it exists, that's what they have figured out to do to sustain themselves. Two, I'm hoping no one is going to be offended by making it personal, Jeff Bezos, <laughs> where the drive to accumulate 
is so strong and so overarching within what he does that that it's very hard for me to comprehend the inner experience of that it's not about judging him i am my imagination is lacking to be able to grasp wanting so much mm. so it's it's on this continuum and i would say that the more it is on this side the more it depletes the planet number one number two that mentality of wanting to have more and of exchanging things and always wanting to get the best deal and all of these things that is inherently extractive and instrumental relationships and that is my concern that that participates in the depletion because with all the convenience and all the things that we have now my assessment is that our use of resources is in extraordinarily inefficient we use much more resources for far less well-being so that that's my concern it, it i'm wondering if you can see that it isn't about me thinking that it's bad and evil <laughs> yeah no i wasn't saying that you you would term them as bad and evil per se but, but but when people hear you describe business in the way you did in the intro that that's how they might that's how they might hear it um, but I think when you describe that, those problematic characteristics that I think are certainly, you know, um, made manifest in much of the business world, I really share that that concern. And I think, you know, where I bring this back to, to source um, is, as I said at the start, you know, I don't fundamentally think in terms of companies or businesses or non or nonprofits or organizations. Mm -hmm at all but fundamentally it's about creatively what are we trying to do especially mm -hmm. you know, in these times and in the, the predicament that we find ourselves in the world yeah. of energy natural resources then the list goes on and on um and and first of all looking at where when we do source something so when we bring something in the world where does that come from and i think ultimately you know really that that comes down to a spiritual question and i think you know some of the answers that i've heard people give when people say well where does it come from if i am a source and i've started this this thing this initiative you know you know including yourself as the as the founder of the nonviolent global um leadership liberation liberation, liberation. sorry <laughs> i blanked on it from that. Even you knew it was an l word yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know where does that come from and i think you know i, th I was thinking back to um you know a wonderful source in japan who i got to know last year um yuko yoshihara and she started a an initiative for the junkan community and everything that they do and that she is sourcing comes from the the idea of living soil so it really comes from the earth and it's really interesting when you ask people who've founded anything like where did this come from and some people look to the heavens and it came from above for others it's sort of in the atmosphere around them and it somehow they embody that or it comes through them like a channel and and for yuko it was this real sense of up from the earth mm -hmm. i think you know whatever you call it whether you call it a business or a project or an or a non-profit if you're sourcing from that place then I think there's a better chance of us being able to to work with and hopefully change this 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 deep and um, this deep level of predicament um, that we're in right now. And then the other thing, you know, to 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 bring in, you know, especially when we think of some of these very um, famous, you know, entrepreneurs and business business people and CEOs and all the rest of them is the role of money in all of this and interestingly this is the the nature and the the human relationship to money is where peter koenig's research began before he um clarified the source principles and what seems to happen is people focus on making money as the goal in and of its if it or seemingly as the goal in and of itself would be that through maximizing profit or shareholder value or the other ways that this is described you know in in the business in the business world but peter's observation was that actually nobody is motivated by money no one's trying to make as much money as possible which sounds like a ludicrous thing to say because we seem to see that everywhere but what peter would say is that what people are really motivated by is the qualities that they project onto money so i use project mm -hmm. in the psychological um sort of Jungian um, sense of the word. And I think the really interesting thing is, is, so now when I see someone, 
you know, like a like a CEO or who seems to be doing everything they can to make as much money as possible. I see someone with a huge inner lack, and I'm curious about what it is they think that money is. Mm -hmm. And often, you know, as I've asked, you know, many hundreds of, of people what they believe money is, and they will say it's security, it's freedom, it's success. Um, and that's really what they're chasing. And actually, you know, I think to turn things around, to turn things around, we need to do this inner work to feel like I can be secure and I can feel free. Um, and I can feel successful if I need to feel successful with and without money. Mm -hmm. And that's really, really important, I think. And it's the it's a it's a core part of the um of the source work and likewise as well uh, you know we started to get into this a little bit over email in the run-up to this event there can be the opposite to this chasing mm -hmm. the money in search of these these positive qualities that we project onto it which is um negative stories about money and here i will use words like bad evil evil mm -hmm. um, dirty and you know and a hundred other words that we could that we could rattle off and the interesting thing is, is just like these positive attributes, people are externalizing a part of themselves. So there's a sort of a disintegration, a lack of a lack of wholeness. And actually, the, the, the interesting thing is, is they're all parts of our, ourselves. And so doing the inner work to reclaim our projections and, and looking at how we relate to money is a fantastic way into that. Mm -hmm. Money is like no other human invention in that it only exists as we tell a story about it. It doesn't have any real form. It doesn't exist in nature in any, in any way, only as we tell a story, it creates a myth. Mm -hmm. that it does. Um, but that's so much of what I think is, is pulling us off course. So I think if we have people showing up in the world as sources from a place where they're not externalizing parts of themselves, in particular to money, and letting that be a, a big distraction in the way of, of creativity and instead channeling in some way, you know, what the world really needs from them today, which I'm sure is what is what you're intending, intending to do and are, and are doing um, with nonviolent global liberation. I got the name right that time. Um, and that's what the best sources are trying to do. So that's what I focus on is like, who is the source? Because if mm -hmm. we start to look at, oh, you know, NVGL is, is an organization, but we don't look at who the source is. We can't connect it to a human. You know, what Peter Koenig described as we can be distracted by, by what is something like a phantom. You know, it's not like Amazon is causing problems in the world. Actually, it's helpful to know that Jeff Bezos is the source. And actually, if you sort of start to look at his personality and were to look into his soul, you would probably explain a lot of what has unfolded. Mm -hmm. But let me let me pause there because I'm talk I'm talking a lot. I'd love to hear more from you, Mickey, and then maybe the audience. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'll try to be super brief because I'm really interested in hearing from people, and I, I want to say um, a, a very few things. One is, I have a definition of money that satisfies me completely, and and the. There may be other definitions, but I don't need them because this one feels just mm, to me, which is that money is a, uh, is a unit of claim on the world's resources. That is what money gives us, is the capacity to access the actual resources. Because money itself is, like you say, it's a total fiction, but it's a very potent fiction. It's a fiction that we orient to and that literally makes us live or die. The orienting to the fiction, not the fiction itself. Um, so that, that's the way I understand money. Second thing I wanted to say is that within NGL, everything that we do is based 100% on money that moves freely. There is no exchange. We haven't once charged for anything that we have done. We have always invited people to give. And amazingly enough, we are now going to be six years old in September. And uh, we distribute money three times a year. And uh, this time around, we just finished one of the cycles. $122,000, something like that, were distributed to about 30 people, 100% based on need. 
So when it was like two, three, four, five, six people, there was nothing to advertise about it. Now that we are able to do it at this level of scale, which is still tiny, but a significant tiny, not a curiosity. It's like, and that means that 30 something of us, all or part of our sustainability comes from money freely giving, given to NGL. And I invite anyone here who is inspired to do that, to give money to NGL. If you feel inspired and want to contribute to this experiment, and I imagine at least one of the NGLers would be able to find the link and put it in the chat for anyone who wants to give. And the request for giving is always very simple now. It took me 15 years to reach this simplicity. I invite people to give the most they can give without overstretching or resentment. So this takes care of both the material limits and the emotional limits. So the people who have all these projections that you're talking about may very well give far less than they are able to in terms of their capacity to sustain themselves. But if they gave more than that, they wouldn't have the capacity to live with themselves easily. And that's fine. So it moves freely. And that is a possibility. That is my picture of how I want resources to flow in the world, from where they exist to where they are needed based on willingness, capacity, and purpose, which is a big sentence to unpack. The last thing I want to say before opening it up to other people is that humans existed for like 98% of our uh, evolutionary existence as a recognizably human species were in the gift economy without structural power, without money, without any of those things. All power that existed prior to the what I call the patriarchal turn was based on personal power and natural authority, which I think overlaps very strongly with what you call source. And that means power that arises from internal resources. What patriarchy has done is shifted the source of power to be based on access to external resources, either structural power mediated directly or indirectly by the state or structural power that comes from making this or that group more or less valued. And those sources of power are very easy to use over other people. Power that comes from our internal resources, either our personal power to just be able to live and make things happen, or the natural authority that we have, which is the places where we have non-redundant capacities that people can recognize in us, neither of these lends itself easily to being used over other people. In those circumstances, I am really far from certain that you need one source. This is my empirical curiosity about what happens when power is fully restored to us, whether it would need be necessary for there to be one source. Because what I'm seeing in my experience is there are contexts where I operate, where I am definitely fitting your category of source and contexts where I function and I don't, where there is true collective holding of something. And it feels different. And since I know both of them on the body level, it's clear to me that there are contexts that are different. And I want to leave it with that. Maybe we will pick up this at another conversation. If you're okay with it, I would love to open it up to others. Are you okay with that? Or do you want to say one oh, more thing? There's so much I'd love to unpack, but but like you, I think it's time to, to hear, from, hear from others as well. Um, but maybe one one thing one thing I will say just about the relationship to money is I would still hold that even a, and I recognize that story that that money is a unit of claim on the world's resources and I think that's one way that money is functioning in the in the world today but I would just open the possibility to say that's not fundamentally what money itself actually is the money itself is a completely neutral medium and it's really interesting to start to 
to, to explore what particular stories we get attached to about what might Okay, be. then I will say something brief, which my issue is not money. My issue is with exchange. Money is a, it's a medium of exchange. And for me, the issue is even if there's no money, if we are in exchange rather than in the flow of gifting, we are already instrumentalizing relationships. So I, I don't have a primary issue with money. It's only a later manifestation of, of what I see as the source of the problem. Oh, to so be continued. I, I can imagine oh, you're very tempted to answer, Tom, but I would like to just refocus us on the topic of leadership, leadership, which I know is connected to all the things you were touching upon. It's just that it might be um, yeah, too much, or I would just like to come back to, let's say, the, the reason uh, why we were here. Um, I have one question from Alex Rodriguez, which is related to this, and it's how your both concepts relate. And then I would like to get more specific uh, to try to see if we can come from the world of ideas and models and context, maybe down to, okay, how does this work in practice? And there's where we can invite a few challenges. So Alex's question says, Tom says that uh, where source is a spiritual question, and I noticed Miki's definitions of leadership as a willingness to care for the whole. I wonder how those two notions might be connected. Could either of you speculate about that from your perspective? So could you say a little bit more? You were kind of like pointing to it now, if you could refocus on, on that for a moment. I would like to try to integrate. Are you open to that, Tom? Yeah, go for it. Uh, the way that I would understand it is if, if someone is called by life to be source for something, that calling from life, which I think, that maps into all the different things that you said about where does it come from? That calling from life is an act of care. I'm not doing it in a narrow sense for my benefit. I am doing whatever I'm called by life because I'm called by life to give something. So in, that's that's the way that I see the integration. Curious if that works for you as an integration, Tom. Yeah, I think that's definitely um, part of it. And I think, um, you know, another aspect of this for me is um, that one of the objections that's, that many people sometimes have to source is it really recognizes us as in, as individuals. And that, you know, and the fun thing is, is that when you really unpick it, there's no such thing as a human, as a human individual. The edges are, are much softer than we think. But, but that idea that we are an individual is part of what makes us um, is part of what makes us human that we can you can look another human being in the eye and say what do you need or what is your soul asking for and we can we can honor um somebody as a human um but it's not only about what working with source is not only about this individual um perspective you know and what peter has always said is for this to really work it has to be about love at its heart and love you know there are many definitions of of love but certainly one of the common themes is it's about this deep interconnection you know and oneness and if you ask people who've you know done a, um, a heroic dose of psilocybin or uh, perhaps ayahuasca and ask them what they experience and sometimes this sense of oneness of ego of ego dissolution um is is part of what what comes up for people and i think like when we're really holding you know whatever your definition is i think we know love when we feel it um, and when we see it and when it's offered to us. Um, and I think when we source from a place where we're really holding that feeling of love in our hearts, that deep interconnection, as well as saying, I am a creative being and there is there is a me, um, that that's when I think that we have a better chance of really sourcing from the wholeness, from the place of what the world um, really needs, not from a place of, of separation or, or domination. What do you think, Mickey? Common ground? 98% enough to not want to say more at this point and really hear from others. Yeah. Thank you. Another question um, that kind of like emerged was of what can support us as individuals as well as group as groups in the shifts and reprogramming that is necessary in order to really embody collective leadership? So what can support us as individuals? and its collectives what do you think you want to take it or you want me to take it 
I'll maybe I'll maybe just focus on what on one thing and then you can give yeah a broader answer because I've really enjoyed some of the things I've heard you say about this previously um in other forums so yes yeah, so I'd go back to this um this point about our projections and looking at what's in our in our shadow um so yeah so one way into that is to explore your relationship with money but really what you're trying to get at is what do you externalize of yourself and I've, I've almost found, well, I have found on many occasions that this cuts through a lot of other kind of stuff that we might have as individuals that gets in the way of us being able to show up well, you know, as individual creative beings and in, in collective situations. You know, another example of this is looking at what triggers you the most, like when you when you when you find yourself really reacting to somebody else, what is the character that you're seeing in them? that is most bothering you and if you can recognize that part of that character is part of is part of you as well that we all have all of the characters that exist inside of us somewhere and to be able to reclaim that so that we don't externalize it and only get triggered um, by other by other people uh, but can actually become more whole and more more integrated and this includes the really icky um nasty ones so the you know some of the worst judgments that people place onto others i know mickey you say you don't judge other other people or put those labels on them but um but i think yeah often if we can identify yeah what troubles us most about other people or about other things out there and use that as a sign that it's a reflection of something within ourselves and reclaim that then that can be a really powerful way to be able to show up from a place where we can just connect to that channel of creativity of what needs to be done. So that's one aspect. I mean, there are many others, but that's that's one that can go very deep and be very transformative in my experience. But yeah, Mickey's got what's more. Uh, just to be clear, I didn't say that I don't have judgments arising me. Bad yeah. and evil are not words that come to me. And when judgments arise, I'm not interested in them. I don't have an attachment to them. They don't stick. But that's after many years of practice. So but I, I want to answer the question at a different level, which is um, I discovered that no amount of individual skill or individual capacity is enough to make a group work without having practices and agreements and things in place at the collective level. So whatever the qualities are that we want to anchor in how we function, we need to anchor them on a practical plane. Otherwise, we can get into a cycle of endless inner work, inner work, inner work, inner work that doesn't actually transfer to the next layer which is how do we function collectively? So, um, for example, if if I'm talking about what um, about practices, um, please excuse me for a, a, a second. I need to say something around here for just. Here. Okay, there's a phone that is making noise, so I'm asking people living with me to turn it off but i don't know if they're hearing anyway i think one of them heard so um for example if we know that um, we have issues with decision making that troubles arise in decision making then we can make agreements about how we make decisions and those can be super practical, not like uh, big abstract principles. But for example, we can, one of my favorite practices is creating what we call a decision-making matrix, where you take, you map all the decisions that as a group you might need to make. And for each of these decisions, each person, we're talking about collective leadership, so we're talking about voluntary participation, not coercion. So each person marks themselves in the decision-making matrix along the lines of what level of participation they want in relation to which type of decisions. And you can be a one, which means 
you are the one who tracks it and notices when there is something slack in that area and a new decision needs to be made. You can mark yourself as two, which would mean you really want to participate in the decisions. You can mark yourself as three, which means I want to give input and then I entrust it to the one and the twos to make this decision. You can be a four, which says, I, I don't need to participate, but please, would you let me know when you make new decisions? Because otherwise I won't know and it will disrupt what I'm doing. Or you can be a five, which is an amazingly delicious place to be. Please keep me out of this loop. I don't want your emails and questions about this type of decision. I don't care if it's pink or yellow or orange, what you put on the wall. doesn't matter to me. It, I trust it will all work out and I don't even need to know. If you do this kind of mapping well and you do it iteratively within units, then it's always clear who needs to be involved in a decision. That's just one type of practice. Another type of practice is the advice process, um, which is well documented by Frederick Laloux, um, with the exception that there's a, one more category of people that I believe need to be involved. And I actually checked with him and he agrees with me, but I don't think that it's possible to stop the train and make updates. And that is people who have resources that are critical to the implementation of the decision even if they're not specifically impacted and don't have specific expertise, if they are not engaged, they might not mobilize the resources that they have for the implementation. So this is just an example. This is in the decision-making. There are other areas of functioning. If you want to function well collectively in a world in which separation and disempowerment are foundational to how we function, you need to put in place practices that will bring you together, that will honor the capacity limits and all of that. And that's many hours of uh, conversation. I just gave one example. Thank I might you. just add, oh, sorry, Elif, do you mind if I- Go, go on, Tom, I'll just interview. Yeah, so I think sometimes what we see is almost like a continuum where on the one hand you have people, I think you alluded to this, Mickey, where, it's almost like, oh, if we just do enough inner work and work on ourselves, then everything will just flow. And that's a total pipe dream, <laughs> doesn't, doesn't work. But then on the other hand, you have the opposite where people say, well, if we just create enough structure and process and governance and rules and all of that stuff, then it will work. And that doesn't work either because, you know, the, the personality pathologies or the, tra the traumas and the power structures and everything that can't be you know, made explicit will, af will affect it. But what I would say is when we, or what I see is when people really work with source, first of all, acknowledging themselves for what they're really the source of and take the natural responsibility for themselves and for what they're sourcing and acknowledge others as they, as they do the same. What we see is the need for as much structure and process gets greatly reduced. But I don't say down to nothing <laughs> because I think that, would, that doesn't work either. But actually, it is a way to reduce this this sort of this burden of, of too much structure and process. Because I think at the extreme ends, you see sort of top-down management hierarchical bureaucracy being replaced with self-management bureaucracy, you know, like this kind of Dungeons and Dragons level of complexity about how on earth you get things done and navigate your way around the around the system so for me like finding the right mix of both like I, I see it working so well when people will yeah first of all work with source but then put in supporting structures and practices so that they can actually get things done like make it like making decisions and just getting the work done because ultimately it's the work that's the that's the thing that um that realizes the vision in the end so we just add that um, I want to say that the way that we think of it within NGL is we came up with this term, purpose-oriented uh, trauma healing. So you do only the inner work that is necessary for the purpose at hand, that isn't able to be handled by making very conscious agreements about how to deal with someone's limitations. So there's something about not needing to change the limitations, just being able to relaxedly and tenderly say, yes, I have a limitation in this area. 
and then other people know and we can all orient to each other without having to do the inner work because we just compensate and mm. sometimes it's impossible to compensate and then you need to do a piece of inner work to jump start your individual capacity a level and then it's easier for others uh to work around it it's it's very very um what's the word um choreographed how much inner work is necessary because the trap of i must heal everything that's ever happened to me before i can actually step into leadership that's a very very difficult trap <laughs> yeah i agree and i think you know one of the things i find interesting about this my colleague fanny norlin you know has been encouraging me recently and i think this is a good path to actually focus less on self-development which is a thing that's talked about a lot you know which is probably another uh, way of saying inner work but actually more than anything it's about self-awareness because I think what I heard you describe there Mickey is even if someone could go oh something I've heard of that's happened there has touched on a tender part of me and that's affecting me now like that alone without having to do the work and heal everything or totally objection which might help if that's the thing you want you want to do but just having the awareness that it's there that can actually get us quite quite a long way I think um so yeah, just wanted to throw that in, but I'll hand back to you, Alicia. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to let you know that since we still have a few things on the table and we're finishing theoretically in just 12 minutes, um, I thought that we could go to the top of the hour with the discussion and then those that can say we go into breakouts, those that have to leave, leave just to offer the integration for those that can can take it, if that's okay uh, for you. Would it be okay for you, Tom and Mickey? Yeah, of course, happy to take the lead. Oh. Good. And I think you answered a bunch of questions already with that intersection of inner work and structure, but there was a question um, that was repeated quite a bit around what happens with leaders and individuals that are they have these blind spots, they are not open to feedback, and they are in positions of uh, leadership, and specifically there was a question from Bianca, let's say, so what's the most effective way to relate with the source of a network if you can tell that they are not doing the sor their source work, afraid to look inward, not valuing as much as action. Um, yeah, and of course, options that are maybe not living or communicating in an effect in an effective way uh, with the with the source. What are your thoughts? Mm, yeah, I guess I, I should take this one. And it, one of the things that I do see sometimes is really um, well-meaning, capable, change makers in all kinds of spaces from sort of networks to businesses dare I say it dare I say it um, who want to make change but actually because they're in the field of a particular source I see them getting burnt out often trying to make a change because it's requiring someone else to change because source in itself is neutral um, but you will get the the pathologies and the projections of the the person who's the source showing up in that field um, so the first thing I would do is I would say, look after yourself and think about how much energy you genuinely um, have for this. I often encourage people to not necessarily have to talk really explicitly about source in the way that I'm doing here, because in this forum, I'm introducing people to a particular um, lens. But you don't have to go and say, right, I've identified you're the source and that means this and we need to do and we need to do that because they may or may not look at it that way. But sometimes what you can just do is start to hold the mirror up and just give people gentle encouragements. And sometimes that's about encouraging that person to show up a bit more. And that's particularly common in, in the more decentralized and participatory um, end of things, that they actually need to be a bit more, be a bit more present um, and sometimes a little bit more top down. That doesn't mean into a power over structure, but just saying what they think sometimes um, and not holding back so much. And in other cases, the opposite is true. And actually what we need to see more of is them letting go and to control less and to create space for people to step in and take responsibility. So starting just the process of identifying who the source is, that's step one, because then you can, then you, at least you know what you're dealing with and it's like who you're dealing with. Instead of feeling like there's just this dysfunction in this amorphous thing that I'm in, you can focus on a person and know what you're dealing with. But then maybe start to, yeah, um, hold the mirror, help hold the mirror up to them and, and, and say what you need from them and see how you go. I mean, there's probably lots more I could say, but I'm conscious of time as well. So those are just a couple of starters. Um, I, I want to 
say a couple of things too. Um, and um, for me, I'm starting from a different angle. So the, the way I would look at it is um, when people in positions of power of any kind do things consistently that we don't like, uh, they're like classic pathways that we take, kind of like absorb and tolerate it and keep going is one of them. Rebel and go for a fight with the person is another of them. Um, another one is um, um, gossiping and doing all of these things. And another one is leaving. And there's, I'm not saying this is exhaustive, but these are just classic examples. And there's another pathway that I call leadership from below. And leadership from below starts with orienting to a shared purpose. So instead of thinking about, here's this individual, I don't like what this individual is doing, nah, 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 and they have power, and nah, all of this, recognizing this individual and I have a shared purpose whether that purpose came from some source or whether we co-created the purpose, it doesn't really matter. We have a shared purpose. And if I orient from there and I position myself as supporting the person in power to actually achieve the purpose that we share, then I'm an ally and everything looks different. So if I eventually offer feedback, the feedback is a gift rather than a challenge. I, I can really tell the difference when people bring me feedback from a critical perspective of separation and mistrust, or if they bring me feedback from a position of joining with me in walking towards wherever we are walking. The, the felt sense is entirely different. So shifting from one to the other is, is an act of leadership regardless of how much power we have or don't have. I also wanted to say something before this event ends, which is one of the reasons, one of the conscious reasons why I created NGL is so that the work that I had been doing already for many years before would have a home and will continue past my death. So there's something explicitly and consciously built into NGL that we are preparing collectively for my death. And one of the things that that means is I have several times gravely erred on the side of leaving something to other people to do without guidance for me prematurely. And every single time that I do this, it fails. So this is one of the places where I want to name a total overlap between how you see things and how I see things, even though the terminology and the framework are different, we are looking at a similar phenomenon here. And, and I, I hope that I finally learned my lesson and I won't do this again, but who knows? Mm. Yeah, I might just add um, two things. So one is, um, that the thing that's always within your power, even if you're, you know, in a, if you've joined an initiative that somebody else has started, you've accepted an invitation and somebody else is the source of that field. And ultimately you can't control what they, what they do um, and how they show up, but you can always stand in your own um, sense of being, being a source and think, what is my soul asking me to do? You know, what's the, what's the world asking my soul to, to do and to contribute to this world and then you can ask yourself what's my next step here in this field that I've stepped into is there something for me to do here or maybe I need to step out and it might be that you need to rebel or try to you know influence or somehow support or help the the source but sometimes it's about stepping out um, as well and then the other thing that I'd say just in terms of you know when a when a source dies or wants to pass things on I've yet to I've yet to see it work where it's just left collectively. So from Peter Koenig's source perspective, which is you know a working set of principles, I don't have a claim of ultimate truth on this, nor does Peter. Um, that succession really works when there is a one-to-one -one succession, and I would say in this case it'd be from Mickey as the source to another individual. It and won't that, happen. 
Yeah, and I know it won't I, happen, and it will be consciously not happening. Yeah, in part because I think the one person thing is within the individualistic uh, life that is so familiar to us. I truly believe that we need to transcend that. So I'm I'm not going to give myself over to that, even if it means the endeavor will fail. But I don't think it will fail. Right now, if I were to die now, it will fail. But it's moving in the direction where things are anchored in different places. And I think it will continue in a, in a very different way from having another person who sits in a particular position. We'll see. So I think, yeah, we will. We'll see. We'll see. Um, and I would just encourage people who are listening to this just to hold the different possibilities here. That there is that there is a perspective that that it that it that it dissipates over time. If it's left to everyone, then it ends up being left to no one, and it functions fine for a few for a few years, and then slowly it starts unraveling. That's the pattern that that we see. So we're not. I'm not saying there should be a successor. It's just commenting on what seems to work. But we'll see. But we'll see. And I'm keen to learn from initiatives that maybe challenge. Yes, I I, I think it's what seems to work. And the question is, are there things we can do to shift patterns of how we tend to function that will make it less likely for that to be necessary? That is a big question, which I don't know the answer to. I'm not claiming that I know the answer. I, I am, I'm just claiming that it's a worthwhile experiment to tenaciously try to build an alternative framework that in my understanding is more similar to pre-patriarchal societies well if anyone's able to to crack it we'd love to hear from you <laughs> We've not i won't it. be around to tell the tale no <laughs> although it might be complete while i'm still alive that that would be my hope yeah yeah this seems like a good moment to wrap up our conversation, although unfortunately it's like we open more boxes than we're able to address topics into depth, but maybe these points to future conversations we will go.